It initially seemed like a bad idea for Pixar to make a fourth Toy Story movie. Not from a financial point of view, of course not, but from an artistic, storytelling point of view. After all, the first three films formed a splendid trilogy, with a narrative and thematic throughline that landed on a near-perfect conclusion. A conclusion that resonated deeply with general audiences and critics alike. So why continue? Hadn't everything that needed to be said about this world where toys come to life been said? Now, Pixar's only made a couple films that I think are downright bad. I at least find some enjoyment in everything else, and in fact, if I had to make a list of my favorite movies, Ratatouille, Up, and WALL-E would be close to the top. Though I generally prefer their original ventures to their sequels, I thought it would be pretty safe to assume that this would be at least a decent standalone film, even if it might feel a bit redundant as far as the general themes and narrative of Toy Story are concerned. In other words, I didn't expect them to do anything that would change all that much about how I felt about the previous films, or about the way that I view the messages of those films. I thought it would be supplementary to the original trilogy, an extra film where we get to see some of our favorite characters again, but where nothing all that extreme happens. Boy oh boy was I wrong. Even if I have some issues with Toy Story 4, it does every bit as much to build upon the previous ideas of this series as Toy Story 2 and 3 did. This is so far from the soulless sequel so many expected. Instead, this film changes everything about Toy Story. The first Toy Story had a lot banking on it. I mean, it was the first fully 3D computer animated film. So there was an obvious question. Was it going to serve as proof that such a method of animating could be used successfully and yield positive results? Was it going to fail in that regard? Or was it going to be nothing more than a hollow tech demo, which ultimately failed to tell a satisfying story? And due to the hard work of many artists, ranging from writers to actors to animators to character designers to musicians and so many more, Toy Story was a massive success. At its core, it's a story about growing up and learning that it's okay for things to change, even if that change is often uncomfortable or even terrifying. As one might expect, the film delivers its message through Woody, the protagonist. One risk the film runs is having Woody be incredibly unlikable. I mean, he's a selfish, frightened toy who is willing to shove Buzz behind a desk just so Andy will spend more time with him instead of Buzz. However, through two wonderful songs, You've Got a Friend in Me and Strange Things, the audience has shown how much Andy's love means to Woody and how hard it is for Woody to seemingly lose it. What Woody does to Buzz is bad, but since we've seen so much of his motivation, since we've been encouraged to empathize strongly with his position, he never feels malicious. Instead, he feels like someone who's finding it difficult to cope with life-altering changes, like someone who's left reeling after they lose what, until now, they've lived their whole life for. Additionally, there's the fact that Buzz doesn't think he's a toy. Due to this simple thing, he's the perfect counter for Woody. I mean, what could be worse than losing what you love? Well, losing it to someone who doesn't even care for what they've gained, or who at least doesn't understand its importance on any level. In other words, to Woody, being Andy's favorite toy is the most important thing in the world. To Buzz, being a toy isn't even worth considering. To me, that would be at least as difficult as losing to someone who's actively malicious. In fact, it could quite possibly be even worse. In the end, Woody's arc in this film is clear. He's right that being a toy who is loved by a child is a very important thing, but he's wrong in thinking that he always needs to be number one. It's okay if Andy has other toys he loves as much as Woody. Woody doesn't have to be, in fact, he can't be the only one for Andy. He needs to accept that Andy might choose things that won't make him happy, but that it's still important for him to be there for Andy all the same. Besides, Andy still loves him. Woody just had a twisted conception of love that stopped him from seeing that. Basically, it's all right for Woody to love Andy and to view Andy's love for him as something wonderful. But once that love turns possessive, there's something wrong. Andy is going to change, as well as the situation surrounding him. Asking Andy to remain static is asking him not to grow up, to not become his own individual and make choices for himself. Overall, Woody learns that such change can be a beautiful thing. After all, Woody gains a fantastic friend in Buzz and together, they help each other grow. For Buzz, that growth means accepting the fact that he's a toy and that he doesn't need to, nor can he, save the galaxy. However, even if his role in the universe is much smaller than he initially believed, that doesn't mean that he's worthless. After their journey together, Buzz and Woody come back to Andy, and even if their situation is largely unchanged, their outlook on that situation has changed. Just as Andy will grow up, the toys must too. Toy Story 2 and the first film cover similar thematic ground, but there are appreciable differences with how the story tackles the concept of growing up. Here, Woody's existential dread is pointed in a different direction. Forward, towards the future. 
Now, that's not to say that he isn't nervous in the present moment, too. He is. After all, his arm is torn, and what if Andy no longer wants him because of that? What if, once fixing him seems too time-consuming or difficult, Andy throws him away? But even if he understands that the tear on his arm can likely be fixed, this sends his mind reeling, and he has to ask, what will happen when Andy grows up? Is Andy's love for him only temporary? This present problem of a torn arm may be easily surmounted, but what about the deeper, more complex problems that wait for him in the future? Much like the future, Toy Story 2 is full of uncertainty. There's the obvious uncertainty surrounding what Andy will do with the toys when he grows up, the uncertainty of what happened at the end of Woody's Roundup, the old TV show starring Woody's likeness that never reached its conclusion, and the uncertainty of what will happen to these other toys, to Jesse, Bullseye, and Stinky Pete, if Woody leaves them to go back to Andy. This uncertainty creates a framework wherein Woody's doubts don't only seem natural, they seem inevitable. How wouldn't he feel this way? He was such a sensation back in the day, but he was replaced, like any toy eventually is, just like how one Buzz Lightyear could be replaced by another one. So much in the film comes back to that idea. The idea that the position these characters occupy is temporary, and one that seems to inevitably end in tragedy. Overall, Toy Story 2 tackles the central ideas of Toy Story in a different way, but it ultimately feels like it's saying something similar. Toy Story says that even if you're not number one, even if you're not the best, you can still be loved and find your place in the world. Toy Story 2 says that, even if love is temporary, it's still worth experiencing. In both films, love is figured as something that could go away. In the first, Buzz is the one who reveals that fact to Woody, simply by being new and showing that new people, new possessions, and new passions could all create distance between Woody and Andy. The difference with Toy Story 2 is that it focuses on time, but even so, it's just another force that causes or is involved with change. In the end, Woody has to realize that he can't, and shouldn't, run away from change. Throughout all life's changes, he has to do the best he can to fulfill his role in the world. And what is his role? Of course, it's being Andy's toy. Being there for Andy through all the ups and downs, through all the stages of his life, until eventually he will have to confront the unknown. Quite naturally, this unknown is confronted in Toy Story 3. This time, there's no question of what's going to happen to Andy and the toys. Andy's already grown up. He's moved on from playing with them a long time ago, and they've spent years waiting. But Woody tells them that it's important for them to be there for Andy if he needs them. Whether Andy ever will or not is uncertain, but he's fully prepared to go up to the attic with his friends and remain there indefinitely. The other toys aren't so accepting of this fate. They don't want to waste away up there. They feel like it's time to move on. And I mean, who can blame them after all these years of waiting and after being thrown in the trash? Even if it was an accident, that'd be pretty hard to come back from. So both positions make sense. Woody is holding on to his ideals, the ideals that got him through so many conflicts in the past, and believing that his position in this world remains similar and is still important. Even if Andy moves on, Woody's still Andy's toy. The other toys, meanwhile, question why they can't move on. After all, if Andy has, why shouldn't they? The bigger conflict of the film arises from this debate, as all the toys other than Woody go to daycare. Here it seems that there will be an endless stream of children to play with them for all of eternity. You get all the love without any of the heartbreak. But it quickly becomes evident that this is a false utopia. Instead of all toys being loved, certain toys are horribly mistreated while others reap the benefits of this broken system. In attempting to avoid heartbreak, they've entered into a hell of sorts. While this is going on, Woody has to realize that his wishes might not align with everyone else's, and that it's wrong for him to enact his will on others. Maybe the other toys aren't wrong if they think that they should move on. So after a whole lot of wild and crazy antics, they go to Bonnie, with Woody writing a note for Andy to take them there. They accept that heartbreak will inevitably happen again, that they may be thrown away, lost, or forgotten, but they also decide to remain in their roles. They'll simply be another child's toy. However, the idea that a toy should be a toy that a toy should be played with and loved and cherished by some child, is never questioned. Just like in the other films, that's what a toy is meant to do. Nothing has changed in that regard. In fact, this film seems to strengthen that position. So far, the villains have strengthened that same position. First, there's Sid, who mistreats, tortures, and destroys toys for fun. Second, there's Stinky Pete, who wishes to remain in his packaging and doesn't want to be played with at all. Third, there's Lotso Huggin' Bear, who is replaced and believes that it's alright to hurt other toys and be a tyrant, so long as he can be loved by new kids and never get replaced. All three of these villains have one key thing in common. The way they view humans' interactions with toys is portrayed as incorrect, and they are punished for that. Sid is punished for hurting toys when they rise up against him and traumatize him. Stinky Pete is punished when Woody and his pals put him in a little girl's backpack, 
where he's taken away with the promise of being played with. Since he wanted to remain in his packaging, this is a nightmare for him. Lotso, Hug, and Bear is strapped to the front of this garbage man's truck. All three of these characters have their own way of thinking turned against them. Sid played wrong with toys, so now the toys play wrong with him. Stinky Pete wanted to force Woody, Jesse, and Bullseye to go with him to a place where they'd never be played with again, so now he's being forced to play a lot. Lotso, Hug, and Bear isn't going to be loved again for a long time and will be at least as dirty and distressed as the toys he left to suffer on the bad side of the daycare. As such, another commonality between them is that, as far as we can see, there's no real redemption for them. They are decidedly bad. Which brings us to Toy Story 4. See, Toy Story 4 has an antagonist, but it doesn't have a villain. At first, Gabby Gabby might seem to be like the rest. Like she has a twisted conception of how human toy relationships should work, is driven to do evil things because of that, and ends up being punished for her misdeeds. I mean, she's got the first two parts of that. For so long, she's obsessed over this one child and longed to be loved by her. In turn, that leads to her kidnapping Forky so that she can eventually trade him for Woody's voice box. However, she isn't punished for this. In fact, by giving her his voice and then helping her find another child, Woody finds his new purpose. He can reunite other toys with children who will love them, while also living, at least for now, as a toy without a child who enjoys other toys' company. For the first time, we see that a toy can live and enjoy their life while not being with a child. This is a massive shift in how the film conceptualizes toys' lives and their purpose. Before, they were only in a good state. They were only morally good if they wanted to be with a child and make a child happy. Additionally, without a child, they were destined to be, at best, miserable like Jesse, and at worst, malicious and cruel, like Lotso Hug and Bear. But in this movie, well, what seemed to be a moral rule of the universe is rewritten, and the position of a toy becomes far more complex. Before, it seemed natural that Woody's fears about being lost or discarded would be fixed by finding another child, as they seemingly were at the end of Toy Story 3. But the fourth film reveals that it's not so simple. He can't replace Andy. For him, at least right now, there isn't any other relationship with a child that can leave him feeling fulfilled. That part of his life is done and it's time to move on. And moving on doesn't mean just moving on from Andy. It means moving on from being a typical toy. Essentially, once again, he needs to realize that the way he's been viewing the world is false. After all, what was Woody's greatest fear? I'm sure that there are many ways that this could be phrased, but I think it was losing the love of a child. Indeed, if Andy ever stopped loving him, how did he see himself? As nothing more than trash. Yet now he has to confront the fact that trash has come to mean more to a child than he does, and in doing so, he needs to reevaluate his assumptions about how the world works. He has to realize that, even if a toy is sold off or lost, they don't cease to matter. Like Bo Peep, they can still have an identity. They can still live fulfilling lives. In considering this, it's important to focus on how important Woody's voice is. Now, I don't mean his voice while he's talking to other toys. I mean those catchphrases he says when a kid pulls his string. Because that voice was the only way he had to communicate verbally with a child without scaring the crap out of them, even if the words weren't his own. Before this, the thought of getting worn or tattered filled Woody with fear. Would Andy get rid of him? Would any other child ever want him? But now he can move on from that. He doesn't need to communicate that way anymore. Instead, Gabby Gabby can, and in doing so, she can experience what Woody already has experienced. Besides, Woody finds another type of love here, and it's just as legitimate a love as his love for Andy, the love he shares with Bo Peep. As such, Toy Story 4 shows that sometimes, even if you lose what you love, you can find something else that makes you happy. Of course, that doesn't mean that you can replace what was lost. Some things, some people, some memories, some loves are irreplaceable. Thus, Toy Story 3 and 4 provide different answers to the same question. What do you do when you must move on? In the former, we see that you can find a situation similar to your old one. Even if it will inevitably differ in some ways, it will still be comparable to the past. There's nothing cheap about the happiness that course of action will bring, but it won't work for everyone. As such, in Toy Story 4, we see that we can find happiness outside of our past roles and passions. We can move on by reinventing ourselves, by reevaluating the world, and by discovering new possibilities. It shows that there's no simple answer to a question as loaded as, how do you accept change? But there's a beauty in the endless possibilities of how you could answer, and happiness to be found there, too. Thank you for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed it. 
As always, I want to thank my patrons over on Patreon.com who help support me in making these videos. If you enjoyed this video, I have some other ones that you can check out here, and I encourage you to subscribe to the channel if you find that you enjoy a bunch of my stuff. Thank you, and I hope you have an awesome day. Bye-bye for now.